Someone once told me, football is an incredible game. Sometimes it's so incredible, it's unbelievable. Now, whether you choose to interpret that in a positive or negative light, I will leave that to you. Because today we are indeed talking about football, specifically the football scene here in Singapore. And as I say that, I suddenly feel like I can hear some signs and groans from afar, people listening in, you know. <laughs> so that's our conversation for today. Hello everyone, welcome back to Heart of the Matter with me, Stephen Chia. Now, there was a time when a football game in Singapore would draw in the crowds. Hundreds of thousands of fans would come to watch the likes of uh, Fandi Ahmad, V Sundramuti and Stephen Tan. They would dazzle us on the pitch. But these days, our stadiums seem a lot quieter. And one might say the football scene in Singapore has lost some of its allure. In fact, some might even say it's struggling to survive. And part of it has to do with the fact that they seem to keep losing games. So in January this year, there was the ASEAN Football Federation Championship. Singapore made an early exit losing 4-0 to Malaysia. Two weeks ago at the SEA Games, another humiliating defeat, a 7-0 mauling by Malaysia. In fact, Singapore has not qualified beyond the group stage for the past 10 years. So what's going on? Why do we seem to be stuck in this rut? And what needs to change? Or is there no longer any hope for Team Singapore in the football world? With me to discuss this topic today are Philip Goh, former Deputy Sports Editor at Today. Hi there. Edwin Yeo, General Manager at SPRG and also a former football writer. Hey, hi Stephen. Nice to be here. Bernard Tan, Acting President at FAS, that's the Football Association of Singapore. Hi Stephen. Thank you for having me here. Well, gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Uh, let me start with, well, there's no way to pepper this nicely, but your reaction to the 7 0 mauling by Malaysia. How did that make you guys feel? Horrible, horrible. Yeah. Um, when you, when you, it's not just 7 0, 7 0 to Malaysia, right? So that's our rival. That's someone that if you follow Singapore football, you, you know, you can lose to anyone, but you want to lose to Malaysia, right? And I think that that was a horrible feeling. And honestly, very few words can describe it. As okay. you watch each goal go in, you sink lower and lower. But the good thing is I'm a Spurs fan. So, you know, when you're a Spurs fan, you're used to this feeling <laughs> on an ongoing basis, right? So your so, heart was a little yeah, bit hardened already. A little bit hardened already, yeah. Philip? <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, my, my instant reaction to that result was this is absolutely reflective of the levels of football in both countries right now. We've been losing at the age group competitions for quite a while now. Every single age group competition that we go to, we seem to come back with very adverse results. So if you see the progression of the results at under 15, under 17, under 19, and now this true blue under 22 competition, we knew that we were going up against tough opposition. Uh, perhaps the scoreline was a bit inflated, but it truly reflects the situation of football in both countries right okay. now. So the in fact a way, that they are, they are there, they are continuing to progress, but we've been regressing. Right. So not totally unexpected. Not totally your... unexpected at all, to be honest with you. Okay, yeah. and Bernard, what did you think? What were you hoping would be the kind of final result? First, let me just reinforce yeah. uh, Philip's point. I think his observation that we are doing worse in uh, age group games is absolutely spot on. Okay. And the key thing that we ought to be discussing is why is this happening? But rather than reflecting my views, let me just reflect the views of some of the people uh, players who actually played in the game. Mm -hmm. So I've managed to spend some time walking around the fields with a number of players and every one of them actually are really shell-shocked. They reflected the same feeling that we entered the game, we knew it was going to be tough, but we never in our wildest dreams thought we would lose 7-0. And they were disappointed. Some of them can't really explain what went wrong on the field. And I think they need some time to digest as does the technical team to really ask ourselves, you know, what really went wrong. I think that a team that is inferior can still put on a very good fight against a stronger team if you're well organized, you're disciplined and you have a game plan. Okay. And somehow or other that didn't didn't come across. And I think that's really the cause of the disappointment from the Singapore fans. I don't really think that Singapore fans are unrealistic. We know where we are, but we do expect Singapore players when they put on the jersey Yep. to represent the country in the right way. Yeah, we all want that for our fellow mm -hmm. Singaporean players. But you said they are trying to sort of figure out what went wrong. I I'm surprised to hear that. One would imagine that after the game is over, all the people watching, the coach, you know, the experts watching would say, well, this is what went wrong. You guys missed out on this, missed out on that. I mean, so why is it we still don't seem to know what went wrong for well, that game. Stephen's not so easy and I'm sure my fellow colleagues here will be able to also discuss a little bit, right? It's hard to explain why people were not in, in positions they were supposed to be. It's hard to explain that, you know, the body language wasn't right. You know, that 
it's almost to the extent that you almost gave up, you know, in doing one to one challenges. Um, I think the coach can't really mandate for those things, although you know players okay. need to reflect on themselves. Actually, what you're saying kind of points out what went wrong. If you're saying the True. guy was there no, but they were, they not were, there, you yeah. know what I mean. So the the real thing that they are asking for is why wouldn't the performance levels to the level that they are used to and expected? For some reason, everything that went that could go wrong went wrong on that day, okay. right? And I think that's something that we all need to sit down and reflect. So the the coach of that particular team, Philip Ao, had already spoken prior to the C Games when uh, we actually lost two lead up games. Said you know whatever is going wrong with Singapore football went wrong ten years ago. So he's already pinning the blame right. on things happening ten years ago, basically saying that things didn't happen ten years ago. That push. Singapore football in that particular direction where we could be winning right now and instead it's been on a gradual decline. Mm. So the question that FAS needs to ask himself is what have we not done right at the age groups to prepare our boys coming through uh, to graduate into decent okay. players at, at the senior level. So you're saying it's not just that game, it, it was a long time coming. It's absolutely it's symptomatic a, a of, of the build-up. To, to okay. but Philip, I, I would have a question about that, Philip. And I read what the coach actually said as well. And to be honest, I was a little bit surprised for the coach to come out and say that uh, because he didn't take the job 10 years ago. He took the job, what, two, three years ago, right? He knew exactly what the standard of the team was when he took on the job, right? And I find it very surprising that any coach in professional football, national level or club level, would essentially say, I just don't have the good players, you know, right. what can I do, right? And while that may be some degree of truth to it, I'm sure Bernard wouldn't disagree that there's some degree of truth to that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think FAS do need to think about what's been happening over the last 10 years and what went wrong. I was a bit surprised that yeah. Philip would say something like that. I, because, I mean, let me pick know, up on that. Though. When you can't, a coach can't come in and say, well, it's not my fault. This has been the way it yeah. is, you know, 10 years yeah, ago. And, and, and that's why you hire a coach to kind of help turn things around. But then at the same time, we've seen coaches come and go year after year. So is it also because we've got, haven't got the right coach? I think that's a really good question. Again, this is something for FAS to, to answer um, and for them to... Yeah, I answer for everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, well today, I'm yeah, sorry, but yes. you, have, you have to answer for that, right? I mean, ultimately, the coach was hired by FAS, right? So I think that's important to, to reflect upon. But yeah. let, let's be honest. If we look at world football at large, hiring the wrong coach wouldn't be unique to Singapore. But anyway. if we had any pick of a coach anywhere in the world, wow. <laughs> what do you think? A Jose Mourinho? Uh, Pedro, uh, well, well, well. That, can I, that save us? We made a massive mm. coup landing Bernstanger into that job, but we just couldn't help him. We couldn't give him the right tools to get his job done properly. Mm. Okay. So when we get into these discussions, obviously people will have uh, opinions on sure. personalities and everything else. But I think the more interesting discussion we ought to have is what Philip has brought up is our structural problems. Why is it that the players that we are producing are really far behind those in our region? I think that's one level in, of discussion. The other level of discussion is even with these players, right? Mm. Could we have done better with a better coach? And that's a more near-term near -term issue. It's more performance issue on the pitch. That's a more structural problem in the long term. So right. I think both we have to have, we split the discussion and we need to address different things at different levels. We know that it takes many hands to make the whole team work effectively, right? So yes, the coach is one of them, the infrastructure, but okay, so we've talked about the coach. So we're saying, yes, there were times some of us felt we had the right coach. That could have made a difference. What are the other missing links? If we talk about talent, the local pool that we have, I mean, we had the Fandi Amats and all that. I mean, do we not have the same uh, talent in our pool right now? Yeah, so perhaps I'll jump in from here. Well, first of all, Singapore is a small country. The number of players that we have playing in our country is obviously the pool is much smaller than larger neighbours like Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, so on and so forth. But that has never stopped countries from out-punching their football weight. We see small countries yeah. performing all we the time. We say that all the time. We yeah, punch we, above we, our weight, exactly. right? <laughs> As a nation, we punch above our weight. But we also know that many footballing nations with very small populations are able to do that. But they'll be able to do that because of unique reasons. Mm -hmm. And for us, if we want to be a nation that punches above our weight, we really have to do a lot more work right, to get to that level. Let me just make some observations, which I've repeated quite uh, significantly to people internally. When I watched the SEA Games and I was seeing Singapore play Thailand, mm -hmm. I also watched Thailand play Malaysia and Thailand swept Malaysia away. It was quite clear from the team sheet, there was a distinct quality. Every player in the Thai team under 22 had one, two or three seasons in Taiwan, the mm, T1 okay. 
So they are regulars and they've been playing at this high level and right. the Thai league is at a high level for a significant amount of time. Two things I just tell you, you know, the, the youngest, the young striker that came to equalize against Indonesia, his name is Yasakon Burapa. He's 17 years old. He has 33 appearances in Thai League 2, which means he debuted at 16. If you look at our team, the average appearance of our team is probably under 20 appearances in the SPL. Right. The top appearance leader is uh, Jared Gallagher. So, so you're saying, yeah. I mean, obviously more exposure will give them more experience, right? And allow them to up their game. What I'm saying is basically, if you're not playing at a high level for two to three seasons and you go for the SEA Games, Right. Yeah. You're facing Thailand. Okay. So why aren't tough. we playing at a high level? Is the it question, what our parents, the parents, yeah. won't let them go? So the won't question is, skip school, why or? are our players not breaking into the SPL at an early age? Okay. Why? So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here. One side of the equation is obviously the SPL clubs are not taking the risk of fielding younger players. There are a whole range of reasons for mm. this, and I will not, you know, go into them because obviously the SPL clubs will have a view, and. We have tried over the years to impose some kind of rule to help to blood the young players so that we have a pool of players who actually have experience. I remember we tried some age caps and that was removed, but we also tried having three under-23s being fielded in the SPL from the season of 2018 onwards. Okay. That rule lasted for two years. Okay. Right? So why didn't it work? Well, first of all, for many of the clubs, they played the players, but the end of the first half, which was the only requirement, yeah. they would substitute the whole lot of them, right? Which means they actually did it right. more as a regulatory requirement rather than actually uh. trying to develop it. Second thing, they were fielded in all the positions that were the least important for the team. So you never get a striker who's under 23. You never get a midfielder okay. that's under 23. You never get a defender under 23. You don't get a goalkeeper under 23. So you get all these players. So I have lots of under 23s with all these minutes and they really are not yeah, in the positions yeah. that you really require them for. Okay, Edwin, Philip, I mean, I want to get your take on this. How do you respond to what Bernard said? Well, simply because the players are not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's in the eyes of the, uh, of the coaches in the S-League. They don't feel like these players are good enough to actually be on the same field as all the professional players. Then it, it comes down to the question of why aren't these players good enough? Yeah, and why right? aren't they good enough? So here's the thing, right? The, the one question I want to ask is, is football being played in every school in Singapore? The answer no. is no. It's not. But other countries would say the same too. Not every school. Even the c countries which have fantastic that, that, football teams. We've talked about so many systems in the past, yeah. right? We've, already, we've always talked about how Iceland has done well or Belgium has done well. And we always talk about how we would like to replicate some of the systems that they okay. have. But the, the, the essential truth that they did in those countries is they built the infrastructure, they built the human resource around this infrastructure and then they built the football teams. So what, what happened is you have the facilities to play football. Uh -huh. They also train up an entire army of coaches, qualified coaches to train these footballers. Right. And they have a buy-in from the society to bring their kids to this football training. Okay. And this is where you have the base-up approach where you actually build your football team from the young age to become good footballers playing to the same so-called syllabus as you grow through the ages. And then when you reach right. the senior level, all of them are armed with the proper skills. So you're and building up the foundation. You, you are building first. up the foundation. Yeah. We don't have a foundation here in Singapore. Yeah. We don't even allow kids to play football in the void decks. We put up <laughs> nails on the void deck walls to prevent them from kicking balls. <laughs> we used to play football in yeah, the void decks. That, yeah. that is the absolute sad truth in Singapore correct, right now. Correct. You know, you can't play and football. You have to turn off the lights at 9 o'clock because, you know, you're, you're okay. disturbing the neighbourhoods. Yeah, well, okay, okay. Let's not go down that road, you know, because there are different arguments for that. But I mean... It sounds like one of the main issues here is also the fact, well, kids are in school, right? And they have to study. They're there for an education. So it's almost like they have to choose. Do I continue to push hard in the academics or do I allow them to take the sporting route? We know in Singapore, we try to do both. Hmm. Very we much can, so, We right? can do both. It's been proven around the world that you can, you can be successful in academics as well as in sports. Yeah. It has been proven around the world. A lot of footballers out there are very well-learned People, they're okay, highly okay. So, so what is wrong with our system then? Because there is a CCA. Sure, maybe it shouldn't be just a teacher who, by the way, becomes a coach, you know. But we have I, to play football in every school in Singapore. Okay, That's I, the reality. I, I, I'm going to jump in here, Phil, Edward. because I used to play like for the school team and all that as well, right? I will say this, at least for what I see today uh, in the school system, uh, 
is not necessarily the best system in terms of developing elite players uh, within the school system itself. Okay. In fact, I think it is probably an obstacle to developing elite players, to be very honest, right? If I look at it, if you look at the school tournament, which is usually three to four months long, right? You have the disparity of standards, right? You have schools losing 27-0 yeah. <laughs> in the game. And literally, uh, the good player learns nothing from that, right? So I think there's one thing that uh, it's a big problem today. And I, Bernard, I know it's, it's not fair on you. You've only been president for eight months, right? But I think this needs to be fixed. If you let the schools go the way it is, I agree that, you know, letting kids play at a young age in schools is important. And I think in Philip's sense, that's, mm. that's correct. But up to a certain point, Th that can't be the case anymore. It can't be the school system. So you're talking about 13, 14 year olds to me, they would have already been identified as being better players. Eight, nine, 10 year old, sure, you know, it's a basic and maybe that, that's where the schools come in and you spot younger okay. kids who are better and all that, right? I think part of the problem is the system that we had in the past keeps changing partly, right? I mean, we had JCOE or a junior center of excellence back in the past and all that, and that disappeared and things like that for whatever reason that happened, right? So the, the system in Singapore, I think correctly that everybody is talking about here, right, is it's not just one problem or the other. And putting band aids over each particular problem isn't really going to solve it, right? I mean, we say the schools is a problem, okay, but then if you don't have the schools, then what do you have, yeah. you know, and stuff like that, right? We also know that in many of the sports where we do well, Singaporeans do well, actually the kids end up taking a lot of uh, private coaching on the outside, which is not always funded. It's usually because maybe parents have invested in that and said, okay, go do it. We've got heaps, we've, we've got heaps of that in Singapore. We've got heaps of private, private yeah, football schools in Singapore. In Singapore. There are a number yeah. of themes that are being discussed here, so maybe let me try to also just interject. Okay. And I'll cover the private <laughs> sure. part as well. So what Philip is saying is basically more schools playing football will help because obviously you will have a wider base of players right, to choose from. right? But if you want to get to the elite level, then you have to look at three things. The duration of practice, the type of quality of training, which coaching and as well as, as you know, the, the kinds of things that you do, and the quality of competition. I think we've not really focused on all three and we must try to fix all three. So I'll give you an example, right? If you're an elite swimmer, mm. how many times do you train a week? Right? I've spoken to the swimmers in the sports school in which I'm a director from, six to eight times a week. Yep. They sometimes do double sessions. But if you ask a footballer at the age of 13 onwards and you want to make an elite level and you want to debut for your SPL club at 16, right? Mm. How many times a week do you think he needs to train? Well, let's not take our benchmark. Right? Right. Let's just look at the Europeans. And they were very clear that at, from the age of 13 onwards, it's four to six times a week. Yeah, but our guys are doing? Very few of them do more. Okay. If we have a, it's twice a week. So just on the duration itself, we yeah. are obviously not getting enough. The second, obviously, is coaching. If you look at what Iceland has, every single primary school upwards has a UEFA B coach. Yeah. Right? Wow. So the quality of coaching is much higher. And then lastly is the competition. It's not just the type of competition which Edwin has mentioned, right? You don't want these useless games that are 27-0 mm. because the winning team learns nothing and the losing team wants to give up football, <laughs> That's right. right? No point. But you want them to be tight so that every game, the boys, all the girls come in and they are stretched. Okay. Not only that, you want frequency. You can't be playing 20 games a year and hope to reach an elite level. You've got to look at 40 to 50 games a year. So on all three fronts, if we are serious, we now need to devise a system in which you get all these elements put in place and then you can ask your questions. What about studies? And that will be a big question. So you, you know all this, Bernard. Then again, what can the FA do in the absence of what the system is today? Good question. So this is the problem, right? The FA does not have control over schools. Mm. We can only encourage. It doesn't have the resources. I think Philip alluded to this, right? The whole country needs to get together. We need to get facilities, infrastructure and all that. We can't do that because obviously the FAS, if people didn't know already, is a charity. So we are relying on right. grants as well as funding from private sources to actually get that to it. So the Anish the Raw is the effort. We have now backing in a Singapore Together project with government seeding the uh, showing the way and then getting private sources of funding to actually come okay. in to lift so, so you feel this is the right move we've been working on this for two years and I'm fortunately you know we sit now in a period where we've hit yeah, this bottom yeah. because nothing's been done before right uh, we've done things before but not Correct. in the kind of deliberate no, but in way. the long term yes. if I ask you 10 years from now yes will things turn around you don't have to wait so long 
Not so long. You don't so have to wait aspirational so long. target right. of World Cup 2034. You don't have Can. to wait so long. So <laughs> let me talk about how I think you know the benchmarks will go. If we start focusing on our junior centers of excellence, we're going to call it junior development centers, yeah. from eight years old all the way up to 17 years old, and we start doing it deliberately, in about four to five years, you will see better performances in the age group tournaments. Okay. Of course, it's not just doing the three things I'm saying. They also need exposure to the international sure. level, which is what Unleash the Raw is going to do. Then, obviously, when you get more exposure and you start to debut earlier, we have more. We will have more 17 and 18 years old breaking into the SPL team because, like Philip says, they are good enough to play. Yeah. Right. Then you will start clocking football at a much higher level. When we go to the C games. They would have two to three seasons. We're gonna be much more competitive than right. we are today. So in other words, we're allowing them to build. You build on, you know, the sort of that, that, that cycle. Yeah. So yeah. Philip, four yeah. to five years. Yeah. I'm looking at this article right now, an interview that Bernard gave to a straight time supporter nine years ago. Okay. Where he said that he would love to see, you know, a great national team ten years from now, which is next year, right? Yeah. There in this in this article, we talked about the launching of a pilot program for primary schools that will possibly get 15% of the children playing. Now, now I'd like to know, right? It's, it's what nine years. What's happened? Yeah, yeah. what happened? What, what's what's yeah. happened in the last nine years? So, as, as always, good intentions don't always come across. I'm going to tell a story about that, the CUPS program. So, when I started, I thought this was a great thing to do. We need to get schools to play. The difficulty of getting schools to play is actually quite phenomenal. We actually launched that program in Sambawang, right? And we wanted the school to own that program. But instead, what happened in eventually evolved was it was an FAS program. Mm. So it was treated almost like an extra activity by a private vendor, right? But if the school doesn't own it and we run it, it's just like running an academy. That was never the intention. The intention was for the school to actually own it and actually develop football along the way with our assistance. Right. I mean, it came to even uh, the funniest part, right? That... On Saturday, when we did the training, we were then discussing who will get the jaga to do the lock you know, and who will pay for him. Right? Right. And they wanted FAS to pay. Okay. Right? So you can see the ownership of that wasn't there. Right? And so I realized that in order to get this moving, it needs to be far bigger than just little incentives like that. Right? And so along the way, while we are trying to build all these programs together, the realization it needs a whole of nation coming together. It needs not the FAS saying that football is important. It needed the whole of nation to say no, football. I mean, it's true. FAS it's is, got to be it, important for all of us. If it's not important yeah, for all of us, that's a there's no trying to FAS. A, I mean, every sport is saying, I want to be the pride of the nation. And I mean, Sepat Takro came back from the SEA Games empty handed. No one kicked up the fuss about Sepat Takro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, Singapore gets beaten 7 0 okay. by Malaysia. You so come so back. we, we got to start wrapping it up. So let me, yeah. let's. Cut to the chase. People are now asking, is the money being well spent? At some point, should we just cut ties and give it up? Maybe use the money for swimming, maybe, because we seem to be doing much better there, right? I'm going to say that you can't treat individual sport and team sport to be the same thing. Individual sports, you measure by individual gold medals. You have a Joseph schooling. Whatever funding he gets, yep. he goes to Olympic school. Football is not the same thing. I would argue that if you look at the actual money going to football in Singapore, many people don't know this. It's probably the second lowest in all of Southeast Asia. Okay. Right? The, the funding that actually goes into football in Singapore today. But we had to compare it to other sports in Singapore? Yeah, but you can't compare it that way because you're not competing against other sports in Singapore. Yeah, but 94.1 right? million bucks over the last five financial years, 19.2 million in the last annual report in 2021. That's a lot of money. But Philip, but that's a but lot Philip of money. It's not with, a lot of money. Philip, no, it's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. Because, it's not a lot of money. Because if I look at what, well, what, what the, Thai, the Thai gets and what the Laos gets, right? Laos okay. is like what? $40 million in funding from the government alone, right? And this is Laos. Laos is a, a country that we should be beating left, right and centre and they're getting like, what, four times the money that we are getting, right? Okay. I think, again, if you look at the English Premier League, for example, there's a very clear sign that the, the clubs with the most money are usually winning all the trophies and the titles. Okay, so I, you're saying we're not spending that much money and what in I'm a way, saying, are we getting what we pay what for? What I'm saying is if, if football really matters and we want our Singapore football to do better, there should be more money into the game, not less. Okay. Now, whether that money should come from us as taxpayers, that's a separate conversation altogether yeah, yeah. because what the football industry and FAS to a certain degree hasn't done very well was to basically bring private funding right. into the into But the your stand basically is that more money will help fix this issue to a certain extent. I think it needs to start from there. Doesn't okay, mean, okay. Doesn't okay, mean okay, that's okay, a solution. Okay. Right? I, I think the public wants more accountability. They want to know how the money is being spent why aren't people being hauled over the coals for not producing the results? 
and they just want someone to stand up and say, look, I didn't do my job properly. I really need to okay. step down. That is where Joe Public is coming from right now. The fact that they, they see the number, 95 point whatever million it, it is over the last five years, to them is a lot of money. To them, it's a lot of money. It's taxpayers' money. Right, okay. And, and they, they want to see some results coming from there. And if the results are not forthcoming, they want to see someone stand up and be accountable for it. So okay, that, that let is me get, the, let's is, get Bennett's okay. response to so that. So, two parts to this, right? So, on Philip's part, there is a lot of money. I second what Edwin has mentioned. The amount of money that Singapore spends is actually a fraction of what our competitors in ASEAN yep. spend. The Malaysian League itself spends well over $9,900 million, right? Our league is probably run for fifteen to $16 million, right? So the, the comparison is actually tremendously different. But the Malaysian okay. League is a very yeah. successful league with lots yeah. of people so, turning up to yeah, the Yeah, Philip, but, but that's the point, right? That's You're point, successful right? because yeah. you have a lot of money. He's making the same point. Right. So, so in but a way, on the, accountability, okay. I will say this straight out, right? I have been in this steering role for eight months. Mm. And if you ask me, should people be accountable for the results that happen on the field? Right? I think they should. Yep. Have we helped people responsible before? I think we can do better. And certainly after the review that we've currently launched, right, we're going to leave no stones unturned. I tend to believe, and I'm not probably projecting what the, the, the report will say, that there may be a culture that is not uh, focused on excellence. It okay. may just be doing activities. I'll give you one example, right? But really, you're saying that about Singapore? We I'll love give you to be one number example. one in everything. Abs absolutely. <laughs> but I'll give you one example. The fact that our boys are so far behind, okay. right? So when you send them for age group tournaments, I think that the current notion is let them go and gain experience and not to compete. I think that's wrong. Right. I have raised this many times, but now I have a chance to actually seriously address it. I think that culture of performance and winning and competing needs to be there. Okay, so every time they go out, they should be trying to win, not just I, try I even and think gain even, the experience. I even think right? beyond okay. this, right? If you're yeah. not competitive, I need to ask my question, do you really deserve to go? Ah, right? okay. I, I would ask that question. Okay. Yeah. And as we wrap up, you've also mentioned the FAS, you're, you're doing a review. Some are arguing though that it's your own guys who are doing the review. So let me explain so that. So is it going to be same, same? No, let me explain that, right? The first thing, if we are going to do a review, the best form, and I've learned this from all my work, is to have some introspection. If I get somebody external, a lot of the, you may have a lot of, of advice, but to be honest with you, he won't know so much about the FAS. Moreover, there's going to be a lot of defensiveness, mm. right? Even from the people there. So that's the first point. The second thing I want to create a safe space. For us to have an honest conversation of what went wrong, I need people to feel confident that they are able to surface it and not be recriminated for it and not be accused of throwing someone else under the bus, their colleagues and so on and so forth. I want to save space. So one of the rules that I've made very clear to everybody else, please be honest, but make sure it's a safe space. So even in the recommendation the report, we're not going to put names. We're not going to address who said what, okay. but we are going to focus on the key points that actually will make a difference for Singapore football. Right? The people that are on the panel, I would dare anybody to say that people are not integrity and that they do not have the best interests of uh, football at heart. Okay. And my own sense, you know, um, actually they will be quite hard right, in their findings. Actually, Stephen, if I can jump in. Yeah. A few years ago, I, I, I did help FAS a little bit and I had the fortune or misfortune of sitting into a council meeting at one point, right? Mm -hmm. I would tell you that the common perception is that it's like the FAS is like one united body. And to be honest, I was a bit surprised in terms of how outspoken some of the council members were in terms of disagreeing okay. with what people were saying and things like that. When I was looking at uh, who Bernard has chosen uh, for this particular panel, to be frank, I have my own opinions about it. But I think just as a football fan, when you see your team play, you have opinions about which player should be selected, which player should be selected. You know, it's really all opinions, right? But if I look at the people that Bernard is actually talking about, some of them are really critics and, and vocal critics. I mean, Jita Singh himself has also criticized FAS. Yeah. So I'm not entirely yes. sure that uh, our opinions are actually better. But I do agree that perhaps FA could think about explaining to the public a little bit more in terms of how do we come to these people. Yeah. I mean, you're in the that, PR you know? field, so you yeah. know what this looks like on the surface to people on the outside yeah, to a certain extent. It, it right? does. This is something I didn't know until I, I started knowing the FAS a little bit better is that I didn't know that the council were all volunteers and did, none of them are actually paid to be there, right? So I think sometimes it's really easy to say accountability or step aside and stuff like that as well. But 
maybe when I understand the sport a little bit more, it would be like, you know, what, what, Bernard, what's your role? Okay. Who's accountable for the performance on the field? Should it be the coach? Should it be the technical director? Who, who are the people who are actually accountable? If you appointed the wrong coach, can you just keep the coach on or what do you do? Yeah. I think there's all those things that probably needs to be better than but, what it currently is. I mean, is. but at the same time, you know? just because you're a volunteer doesn't mean you, you, no, you but, don't have to be accountable but, for... But, but I think what accountability but, comes from in being able to say yeah, this was wrong. How do we do okay. better, right? Um, and if I'm not the best person, then I'll step aside, you know. Yeah. Okay, as long as their conversations are like our podcast discussion, this vibrant and this uh, energetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, we got to wrap it up. Um, last words, I'll give you each a, a chance. Just, to, you know, shout out to all the fans in Singapore who are listening in and also even some of our young players who are listening to this and some of them probably feeling a bit down and out right now, you know. Philip, you can go first. I like to see Singapore football excel, obviously. I mean, all of us are football fans and we, we all remember, we all hug back to the days of the Malaysia Cup when Singapore was doing so well. And, you know, there are all sorts of reasons or, or all sorts of questions why we are not anywhere near there right now. And I think as custodians of football in Singapore, the Football Association of Singapore have a lot to answer for. And I guess that is why... No, the, the fans are speaking out right now. In fact, there's even a, a petition being run right now uh, asking for the entire Football Association of Singapore board to step down. The last time I checked, there are more than 700 votes right now asking for, for the board to step down. And here's the thing. We, we know that that's not going to achieve anything. But again, the questions need to be asked. Why isn't FAS doing any better with whatever we have right now? So there needs to be some kind of introspection, yes. But at the end of the day, football fans live for the results. And they will always measure the national teams by the results that we get. If it's a message to the fans, I would say this. I think one criticism of the fans throughout the years, especially Singaporean fans, is that we only support winners, right? I think football as a sport, if you're a fan, you need to support them when they win, but you also need to support them when they're down, right? And I think the team is as low as it, it possibly has been for a long, long time. I supported the Singapore team, as Bernard mentioned, by, when they were relegated to Division 2. And it was horrible to watch, right? But we never gave up. We still went back to the stadium. To a certain degree, we have to ask ourselves as fans that if we just give up on the team just because we don't like the way it's run and we don't like the performance on the field, maybe as fans, we can do our part and say, let's support the team, you know, um, and when they're down, let's try and get them out. And to be fair to Singapore football fans, what they want to really see is the fighting spirit that we actually have. Uh, we can lose, but the fighting spirit that we actually have. So if if FA can, can help find a re way to bring the team back to the level to fight. And just, what, 18 months ago when we played in AFF and we lost to Indonesia in the semifinals, but we fought tooth and nail and gave them a fright of their life everybody was happy nobody was criticizing Singapore football back then you know so I think as fans let's go through this tough period and see how we can actually do better you know Stephen first let me just address the elephant in the room right I know fans are frustrated I know there is tremendous amount of uh, scrutiny and criticism of what the FAS is I think when an organization is at its lowest point I've mentioned before that I think it's one of our worst nights in our history there is a huge opportunity for introspection and a huge opportunity for change. I ask people for patience to wait for the report to come out because uh, I have a sense that there will be serious recommendations for change and I'm optimistic that we will actually make some progress there. But on the other end, these are short-term measures. No matter how we get the coaches, what we want is a pipeline of superior players coming through. Mm -hmm. And football has shown that if we have systems correct, we can punch way beyond our footballing weight. Singapore has always done this in everything, right? There is no reason we can't do this. But we need the nation to pull together. We need the government, private sector, average citizens to come together with this project. Average citizens, I'm not asking for your money. I'm just asking for your kids to play. Mm. I'm just asking for your kids to participate in this. I'm asking parents to dream that their kid can one day play in the Premier League be a Ronaldo or Messi and not rule it out as something as a fantasy. That if we have enough people stepping forward to say, I'm going to participate in this, I think our future is bright. And that will really change from right here the culture that we have in, in what is currently our football scene. So thank you, gentlemen. I mean, I, I think we all look forward to the day when we can be in that crowd again to s enjoy that euphoria of being behind a team that is doing so well. But sadly, I think for now, we might have to wait a bit. But yes, of course, we know our young lions out there and many of them are trying very hard. So if you're listening in as well, don't be disheartened. So to all listening in, to all the fans as well, I think uh, if you heard Bernard say, the ball's in your court too. If you have... Uh, you know, children at home and I think just to create that atmosphere where we're not 
Maybe for a start, we could allow football in the void decks <laughs> at least up to 8 p.m. Right? <laughs> you know, who knows? Who knows? I, I think the FAS can't get that done. Though. <laughs> uh, this one, we'll let the minister figure it out. <laughs> but yes, I think all of you listening in, if you have thoughts on this as well, you know, we do love to hear from you. So on all the usual social media platforms, you can drop us an email. We we do love to hear your feedback and your comments on this topic, which right now isn't a very easy one. So, gentlemen, thank you for coming in and being brave enough to uh, speak about this very contentious issue. Thank you. For Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And as always, to my CNA podcast team, Jacqueline Chan, Joanne Chan, Tiffany Ang, Sai Win, and Crispina Robert. Till next time, this is Stephen saying, stay vocal, stay engaged.